Church near Ely. Let us begin with a call and answer reading. I will begin. We are to God like precious coins. We are to God like precious sheep. We're seeking out when we wander from God's soul. We seek the holy seeker as our good shepherd among us. Let us pray. We admit to you and to each other that we have not always lived the lives of love. We have lost patience and been true. We have been fearful and insisted on our own way. We have been let love connect. Forgive us and heal us, dear God, through Jesus Christ, your love of the Amen. God has loved us since the beginning, and God's love for us will never end. Do not fear, therefore, but have faith in God's steadfast love, God's healing power, and God's ability to make all things new. Live in Christ's peace. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. This morning for children's time for those young of age and those young of heart, I bring up the idea and the topic of promises. Who's ever made a promise? There's lots of promises we make every day. When I go out to the post box and get up my mail, I am promised that if I put the right stamp on an envelope, it will be taken away and delivered to the address that I write on there. I am promised that if someone sends me a note and has the right address and puts the right stamp on, the promise is that will be in my mailbox at 
after a few days. There are many promises that we make to one another. One of the promises we make sometimes is to get us something that we want. Has anybody done a promise like that before? I promise I'll eat my vegetables. I don't, if I can have a cookie before supper. <laughs> Parents sometimes look a little bit sour on a promise like that. I promise I'll be good at grandma's. I promise I will practice. You don't have to listen to me. I can do it all on my own. Many promises that we make to one another. In our story today, in just a few minutes, we are going to hear about Jesus saying that he is the answer. He is the promise being realized. He is the one that they have been waiting for as a society and as a people and as the world. And so it asks um, us to think about what does it mean when God makes a promise? God fulfills promises. Sometimes, though, we might be a little surprised at how they are fulfilled and what happens in that. People expected many things of Jesus, and sometimes they were very happy with him, and sometimes they were very disappointed in him. They were frustrated or they were angry. When our promises in life are fulfilled by God, sometimes it's exactly the way that we want it to be. But other times, God has other things in mind, which can cause maybe not 100% happiness, can cause some sadness, can cause some loss, can cause other things within us, and leads us to even bigger and greater questions. When we think about promises today, let us remember that God is with us and for us and faithful to us, even if we don't fulfill our promises quite all the time, and even when we question how God fulfills promises sometimes. Let's bless one another as we have the pretzel blessing today. Cross up, good time to stretch out your shoulders. And bless yourself and those around you as we repeat. May the Lord, May the Lord watch, between watch between you and me, you and me while, we are absent while we are absent one from another. One from another. Amen. Amen. I invite the Bell uh, Choir to come up and share with us a great anthem of inspiration this morning.
Our scripture passage today in the bulletin is listed as Luke chapter 4, verses 21 through 30. I'm going to add a couple verses at the beginning, so start at verse 16 instead. Verse 16 of chapter 4 of the Gospel of Luke. May this be a blessing today. It has a little New Testament gospel in it, and it also has a little bit of Old Testament story in there. Let's see what it has for us from God today. When Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And Jesus rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendants and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth, and they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And Jesus said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them, except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. Jesus continues with, There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them were cleansed, except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of town, led him to the brow of the cliff of the hill on which their town was built so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through in the midst of them and went on his way. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The very beginning of Jesus' ministry was a great hit. There was success in Capernaum, in the area, and then our story today says he went to his hometown church. It tells that he was filled with the power of the Spirit and was praised by everyone. Everyone. He was a great teacher. He's the kind of teacher that you do want to do your best for. The kind of coach that you want to show your best moves and what you can do out there when you're playing the game. The kind of inspirational speaker that you just hold every word and it just lifts you up. And then he goes home. And on the Sabbath, he reads from the book of the prophet Isaiah a great section. Great words. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, release to the captives, recovery of sight and the blind. Great. Great passage. And then he sits down, as a teacher would. The teacher would sit. The students might stand. And those who figured him out were looking and saying, yeah, that's Joseph's kid. He turned out okay after all. We've heard, good, we've heard good things about what he's doing out in the world, and we're glad to call him one of our own. So it made sense. The scripture has been fulfilled in 
in, in your hearing, says Jesus. Great, wonderful. Good sermon. Thanks, preacher. We gotta go to brunch. <laughs> then he wasn't done talking. Uh-oh. <laughs> he spoke more. He looked right at their hearts and he said to them things that they were thinking. Things like, great, we're glad he's back. Now he's going to really improve our town. Great, he's going to take care of those who are sick here in his hometown. But he says, a prophet is not accepted in a prophet's hometown. The words go from sweet to sour. And he predicts that he will be rejected. And then, the, I always think the question is, is this the start of the rejection or was the rejection already there? He brings up two historical stories that really rub people the wrong way. And you and I, they probably don't rub us the wrong way in our day and time. But for his audience, those in his hometown that morning, they were rubbed in extremely the wrong way. He brings up Elijah and the widows. When there was a drought for three years and six months, I've never read that part of the story quite the way I do today. Something terrible happening for three years and six months? Ooh, that's a long time. I think almost two years of something terrible happening is long enough. A severe famine over the land. And of all the widows that were in the land, anyone that Elijah could have taken care of, he ends up taking care of this widow in sight. They did not want to hear this story. In a time of drought and famine, the widows suffered more than anyone else. And Elijah is sent to a foreign town to help a widow there. He raises her son from near death. He provides food and oil that will never end until the drought is over. And she says these words, Now I know you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. She hadn't seen that before, only in this moment. And Jesus saw in these words the true belief of that lost woman. And then he tells this other story, which is even more offensive, that there were lepers, many lepers in the time of the prophet Elisha. And Elisha could have healed them all. Who was healed? But Naaman, the Syrian, which doesn't, again, have much effect on us today. But the people of Nazareth who knew this story and they didn't like it either because Naaman was a foreign army commander. And they, in those days, were living under foreign command, under the Romans. They didn't like this idea at all that one of their leaders, their prophets, their religious spokespeople of God, gave to Naaman the tools and the way to be healed. Jesus saw in the suffering and the lost man of Naaman, even in his success in his career, he saw in him some obedience. And when you look back at that story, it is not full of wonderful faithfulness. It's full of questions and doubt. And why would Elisha send Naaman to the river to wash himself? Can't Elisha just come and do that himself? A lot of anger. And if preachers only preach words that provide peace and healing, perhaps preachers are not looking to Jesus' preaching style. Jesus' preaching style fills the people with rage. I'm not going to do that today. Don't worry. <laughs> but it is something that happens. They got up and they wanted to drive him out of the town. 
They wanted to drive him up to a cliff, on the top of the cliffs and have him be thrown off the cliff. Well, you know, if you go back to your hometown and this is the response you get, maybe things aren't going your way. It looks as if Jesus' ministry and his life is going to end here and now. But God was not finished. And Jesus, of all miracle workers, was able to pass through the midst of them, it says in verse 30, and go on his way. Continue teaching and doing his mission. He did lots of important things. Helping people with unclean spirits, healing, calling disciples, including a tax collector, to follow him, pointing out to people where to see God and how to be faithful, and that life is worth preserving, not only for their own sake, but for others. By the 19th chapter of this gospel, when Jesus is going through Jericho and sees a tax collector named Zacchaeus up in the tree, it doesn't surprise us at all that he would pick him. He's described as lost. And Jesus says, the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. To seek out and save the lost. His story continues for us, and many of us feel like we have been lost. That we need to be sought out. That we need to be saved at different points in our life. And Jesus shows us in this, these stories how important it is to turn to him. Who are the lost that need to be found and recovered? Again, we start with ourselves. Sometimes we feel like we are up a tree, like we have leprosy, like we are starving and our children are dying. When these difficult things come around, and Jesus says that he comes to save and seek those who are lost, we find ourselves in a great space of hope, of peace, of relief. Being lost doesn't mean that you are doomed. Sometimes it just means you're in the wrong place. You are not beyond the reach of Jesus ever. And next we look around us. Who around us is lost? Who around us is like the widow who needs attention? There are many around us who are in despair and lostness. And even beyond those immediately around us, I think Jesus points to the story of Elisha, and name in the Syrian as looking beyond even who we can see. That even someone far, far away is not beyond Jesus. Jesus who came to seek and save the lost. Not just those that we might handpick, but by the grace of God, those who he calls for his own good and for the good of everyone. I have a story about lostness that I'd like to end with this morning. Alan Poster, who lived in New York City and then moved to California, received a phone call one day. And the voice at the end of the line said, you had a car stolen in 1969, a Corvette. What color was it? And Alan replied, blue. And the voice said, we have your car. The person speaking was a New York detective, William Heisner, and it was 37 years after the car was stolen. His beloved, Alan's beloved 1968 Corvette was stolen from a parking garage. The detective was 41 years old, so he would have only been four years old when the car was stolen. But the car was no longer blue. It was silver now, with a red interior, with a new engine. Strangely, it was lacking a transmission, but otherwise okay. The U.S. Customs Service had flagged it during a routine check 
of vehicle identification numbers. It seems that the number was listed in a database of stolen vehicles. This car was about ready to be shipped off to a collector overseas. And Alan, who had given up on this car long ago, was getting the car back. And he said, I didn't have a lot of money, reflecting on the time when the car was stolen. He said, I spent everything I had on this thing. It was an egocentric muscle car that had just come out, he said. He said it was a hot car. And I was fulfilling an absolute fantasy of mine by getting it. 1968, that Corvette cost $6,000. And in 2006, when he got it back, it was worth 10 times that amount. And he remembers looking back, I was dating then. I used to drive up the West Side Highway to Jersey, and it was a lot of fun. He was heartbroken at his loss, but it had become for him a great lesson in life. He said it was a wake-up call when that car was stolen. It made me believe you can't fall in love with things. It was kind of an interesting awakening. And then he said, things don't happen by accident. This car has come back to me and I have no idea why. And then, let the statement hang in the air. Maybe it all comes back to you at some point. Well, the things that we want to come back to us the most, maybe people, Maybe memory, maybe skills, maybe physical ability, maybe our health, our mental capacity. Lots of things we want to come back to us that seem lost. The people around Jesus wanted their old Jesus back. The one they knew as a child. The widow wanted to feed her child in the story Jesus told and have her child heal. Naaman wanted healing. Jesus, though, shows a different way of living, of being, of understanding, of knowing what it means to be lost and found, and how things can be made right, even when we are not quite ready to get our minds around but forevermore right. May this lesson today bring us to a new understanding of Jesus and ourselves. May you be blessed by it. As we have our ordination and installation of church officers, I am um, happy and honored to have them come forward who are available today in the sanctuary for their new terms of service. But I also know that not everyone is here in this sanctuary. And would they gather with us in spirit, in mind, in mission, through the power of the modern method of gospel sharing? The internet. <laughs> so I call forward, let me get my notes here. Those who are with us today, we are thrilled that Sarah and Fred Harris and Chris and Dave Baltus are all sharing positions. They're sharing them as couples, their own couple, their own spouse in one position, as deacons. And for elders, Hannah Zacek will be serving one year as youth elder, and Larry Crone, and Becky Grenis, and Bonnie Fensel. Would you come up? Usually we all gather right in the middle. You might want to spread out a little today. I don't know. All right. Very good. In ordination, the church sets apart with prayer and with laying on of hands those who have been called through election by the church to serve. 
an installation the church sets apart with prayer those who have been previously ordained as deacons and ruling elders and teaching <laughs> elders and called anew to a term of service. So I asked the constitutional questions of you all today, and there are many questions, and the last two are divided for ruling elder or for deacon. But the first questions are for you all. Do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledging him Lord of all, head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal and God's word to you? Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confession of our church, as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do, and will you be instructed and led by these confessions as you lead the people of God? Will you fulfill your ministry in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of scriptures and be continually guided by our confessions? Will you be governed by our church polity, and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's spirit and word? Will you be in your own life, seeking to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, loving your neighbors, and working for the reconciliation of the world? Do you promise to fulfill future... To, start over. Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? Will you pray for and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? <laughs> and for Bonnie, um, for Larry, for Hannah, uh, for Becky, will you be a faithful elder, ruling and watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in government and discipline? Serving in councils of the church and in the ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Amen. And for Sarah and Fred, for Chris and Dave, will you be a faithful deacon, teaching charity, urging concern, directing the people's help to the friendless and to those in need? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Now, if you would like to kneel, you may. If you'd like to stand, you may. All right. In the past, we have all of the elders, ruling elders, um, come forward and lay on of hands. Today, if you choose, um, you can stand and hold your hands forward. Um, you can sit and hold your hands forward as ruling elders uh, this morning. Uh, and this is the laying on of hands, the prayer of blessing. May the weight of the hands from here and from other places around the world, remind you that they are with you. They get it. <laughs> they love you and they ask God's blessing upon you. Let us pray. God of righteousness and truth, you brought us into your church to show us a better way to live, you to show us order, to show us love. Bless these called elders, Bless these called deacons. May they govern wisely and faithfully. May they refresh um, and teach and share the gospel. May your compassion and your love pour out upon them. By your word and example, Jesus taught us, and we ask that you empower us to be teachers to others. By your grace, by your spirit, that your whole church may give its life for the sake of your world. In the name of Jesus Christ, who came not to be served, but to serve, we pray. Amen. Congratulations. I just want to hug you. <laughs>
appeal on ordination and installation Sunday that the officers who have fulfilled their term of service are holding their breath until the very end of the prayer. And then they say, because the mantle of leadership is passed, isn't it? Um, and we share it with one another and we take our turn, but we know that at some point our turn will be over. And may God bless those who have served all, all these years so faithfully and those who have stepped up as leaders of the church at this time for their term of service. As we look at our announcements and sharing of joys and concerns today, um, I have a couple of uh, uh, announcements to share. Um, Daryl, I don't know if you wanted to say much, but we give thanks to God that you are all right after your uh, farm accident this week. We um, pray for Karen, uh, who took a fall this week. And Virginia, Jenny Kovic asked us to pray for her daughter, Shelby, who is starting chemotherapy treatments for bone cancer. She lives far away in Florida. Um, and we ask God to bless her and keep her and bring to Jenny, her mother, a sense of hope and peace. Uh, other things on our mind, announcements, um, concerns that we're going to share with one another. We pray for Nora and her family and for this young person that she refers to and for all those who are in the foster care uh, system and all those who struggle with safety and home. Uh, <clears throat> Jody's mother, Betty, will be starting dialysis next week. And uh, just a reminder, there's no collages <laughs> on February 13th. Just, sorry. Try it. March. Um, I would like prayer for my brother-in-law, Larry. Um, he's having surgery tomorrow. He's supposed to be a long surgery. Um, prayer for him. There are additional announcements listed um, in the handout. Those are also sent out later in the day. If you are on the mailing list, um, please, uh, for email, please take a look at those at your convenience. If you're not on the email mailing list and want to be, um, say something to uh, Stephanie or myself, and we'll try to get you on the list as promptly as possible. <laughs> Let us pray. Gracious God, we pray that as Jesus made himself known in his community in his day, that today Jesus will be made known to us. We pray for those connections that we have in our church and community and around us for those that we don't know very well. We pray that by the power of your spirit, you will reveal to us ways that you are working in our family, in our friends, in our co-workers, in our neighbors. Use us, we ask, to represent your grace, your gospel, your truth in our unbelieving world. Lord, we ask that you bless those listed by name today. In our announcement sheet of concerns and prayers for one another and for those we have lifted up this morning we give you thanks that Daryl is well that Karen is being cared for that you are providing shelter and love and protection to surround um, our concern for uh,
Nora's um, house uh, guest. That you're with Shelby in her um, chemo treatments. That you will be at Eddie's side as she faces treatments and therapies. That you will be present with Larry during his surgery. That you are with us and you reassure us and you provide grace and peace even in our times of grief and sorrow. Lord, in the challenge of scriptures today, we look to your son for not only being our teacher and our encourager, but also our challenger to speak truth in times of difficulty, to point to you. We trust him, we trust you, and by your spirit we live day by day. And we say together the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Friends, let us not only love in our words, but let us also love in our actions. And particularly at this time, we're presenting our thanksgivings through our tithes and offerings. Do you remember that we love through our offerings? Let us pray the prayer of blessing together. O oh God, bless these gifts that we have given as expressions of our love for you and our others, that they may bring closer to fulfillment your reign of peace and love through Jesus Christ our Sovereign. Amen. And take with you this blessing. May the grace of God, the love of Christ, and the friendship of the Holy Spirit go with you all, now and forever. And all God's people say, Hallelujah. Amen.